By 1955, Mississippi should have been changing. The Brown vs. Board of Education decision that public school segregation was unconstitutional had been made a year previously. But rather than adapting to this ruling, many white Southerners were taking extreme measures to keep things separate. In the small town of Belzoni, Mississippi, nicknamed Bloody Belzoni because of the number of lynchings there, black people were the majority of the population, but almost none of them were registered to vote. George W. Lee set out to change that, and his efforts were met with two bullets to the head while driving, followed by a complete disregard for his murder and a total lack of investigation. This week on Out of the Past, the murder of the Reverend George Washington Lee. George Washington Lee rose to prominence as a businessman in Belzoni. He knew everyone there, he was intimately aware of the political situation in Humphreys County, and as an activist, he got people excited about change. As Lee grew older, multiple responsibilities stretched him pretty thin. He not only ran small grocery stores and served as a pastor for four churches, but was the co-founder with Gus Quartz of the Belzoni branch of the NAACP. The newspapers in the area were almost exclusively owned and run by whites, so Lee, who ran his own printing press with his wife Rosebud, helped fill the need for information in the black community. Black churches were more than places of worship. They were places where parishioners could gather to discuss political and social progress. Lee's experience as a preacher informed his activism significantly. He was also vice president of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, headed by Dr. T. R. M. Howard, one of the wealthiest blacks in Mississippi. Oh, when we start to hating people, then we get in the same fix that they are in. Lee and the council staged a boycott against gas stations that refused to install colored restrooms. Medgar Evers, who would himself be murdered in 1963, was also an organizer. Members of an organization called the White Citizens Council held many of the powerful positions in the state of Mississippi during the mid-century. Their main goal was to keep everyday life for white folks as unchanged as possible in a changing country. That meant keeping blacks out of the voting booth and thus out of power. The council was adamantly opposed to integration, and they weren't afraid to use violence to stave it off. But they left most of their dirty work to the Ku Klux Klan, who ruled the southernmost part of the state. Whites stood firm in their close-mindedness. This is a clip of the governor of Alabama, George Wallace. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Let us send this message back to Washington by our representatives who are here with us today, that from this day we are standing up, and the heel of tyranny does not fit the neck of an upright man, that we intend to take the offensive and carry our fight for freedom across this nation, wielding the balance of power we know we possess in the Southland, that we, not the insipid block voters of some sections, will determine in the next election who shall sit in the White House of these United States. As more than 50% of the population of Belzoni was not registered to vote, the government was not representative of the majority. There were numerous barriers standing between black citizens and voter registration. Most notably, the poll tax each of them had to pay, and almost none of them could afford, and the literacy test they were required to take in order to vote. And this was no basic literacy test. It required you to be literate in all European languages. White citizens of Belzoni couldn't pass it in a million years, but they didn't have to. They were the ones the incumbent leaders actually wanted in the voting pool. A black uh, Harvard 
trained linguist goes to vote in Mississippi and they give him the Constitution and he asks him to read it and he reads it. Uh, and then they give it to him in Spanish and he, he reads it. And then they give it to him in Russia and they say, what does this mean? And he says, it means Negroes can't vote in this county. Lee and Quartz successfully took the sheriff to court in 1953 when he refused to accept their poll taxes. Somehow, in 1955, Lee convinced 400 black citizens to pay the tax. Lee himself was one of the first registered black voters in Humphreys County since Reconstruction. Unfortunately, many of these prospective voters dropped out under pressure of direct threats from white citizens against them and their loved ones. For most of them, the danger just wasn't worth it, so they abandoned the process completely. On election day, Lee only had 22 black people ready to cast their vote. Lee showed profound courage in this pursuit. White people from the poorest families to the richest, from governors to policemen, were all adamantly against his cause. They were able to strike fear in the hearts of many, but Lee persevered, even though he himself had received written threats just a month before his death. Lee spoke at a meeting of the Regional Council of Negro Leadership in the small town of Mound Bayou in April of 1955 that drew a crowd of over 7,000 people. It was covered by Simeon Booker of Jet Magazine, who quoted part of Lee's speech. Pray not for your mom and pop. They've gone to heaven. Pray you can make it through this hell. Then, tragedy struck. On May 7th, 1955, after Lee delivered a public address at his Baptist church, he got into his car and drove home. He was closely followed the entire way. When he was just a block from his home, two loud gunshots rang out. Lee's car rolled to a stop, crashing into a neighbor's house. He tried to get out of the car, but much of his face had been blown away by gunshots. He staggered, unaware of how badly injured he was. Neighbors rushed to help, but Lee was declared dead soon after arriving at Humphreys County Memorial Hospital. Not trusting the doctors, the friend who took him there packed him up in the car and took him to another hospital where he was again declared dead. The one small report in the local newspaper treated it as an accident. Even with eyewitnesses and hard evidence, police still said he probably just lost control of his car. Unbelievably, when confronted with the evidence of the bullet fragments in Lee's face, the sheriff claimed his dental fillings had been shaken loose in the accident. Numerous black physicians examined Lee's body and confirmed without a doubt that he had been shot in the face. In addition to the pellets, there were gunpowder burns on his skin. Black citizens wanted to notify the outside media, but it was hard to even make contact. Operators refused to put through long-distance calls coming from black people. People had to get in their cars and drive to Mound Bayou to get their calls out. Once the word did spread, the NAACP and other organizations attempted to spark public outrage and seek justice from authorities. Medgar Evers was one of the people sent to investigate. The FBI was brought in, but they were little help, just as they were in the cases of Emmett Till and Lamar Smith, both also killed in Mississippi in 1955. Eyewitnesses, whose identities were protected by the NAACP, told what really happened that night. This is the story in Jet Magazine, based on those accounts. The minister was followed to the edge of the Negro section by three men in a car. Suddenly, one of the men raised a rifle, fired a bullet right into the tire of Reverend Lee's car. Then, as the car slowed down, the other car pulled aside. A gunman leaned over, fired point-blank into Lee's face. Though the gunmen were tentatively identified, according to that Jet article, Nobody was ever arrested. Nobody was ever investigated. This was not a crime, according to law enforcement. It was an accident, which is ridiculous considering all the evidence to the contrary. In all likelihood, law enforcement knew exactly who did it. They just didn't care. 
This disgusting act of violence was a clear message from the white citizens of Belzoni. If you take steps towards equality, we will not hesitate to take your lives. The NAACP held a memorial service in Belzoni that drew over a thousand attendants. President Roy Wilkins spoke, as did Dr. Howard. Reverend George Debbie Lee, who was slain on May the 7th, 1955, was a personal friend of mine. It grieves my heart when I know that these things can take place in the South, and while these killers are widely known in the communities where these crimes took place, up until this very hour, nobody has been arrested because of the death of these men. Therefore, I think that we should stop going across the sea talking about men's inhumanity to men as long as we have these damnable crimes in Mississippi and the rest Lee's wife, Rosebud, held an open casket funeral, which served as a precedent for Emmett Till's mother to do the same when Till was killed one county over three months later. Balzoni continued to enforce Jim Crow laws that kept black citizens oppressed for years to come. Which is why this case is still ice cold. It's unsolved and will probably always remain that way. One of the many cold cases related to civil rights. Remember, if the cops are in the Klan, it's not likely that they are going to provide justice for a black person. It's actually more likely that they were complicit in the crime. When discussing 20th century civil rights martyrs, two names usually come to mind. The two we learn about in school. The two that have statues erected and movies made about them or streets named after them. But Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were only two of the many who sacrificed their lives for this movement. Far too many have been murdered just for simply trying to stand up for their guaranteed constitutional rights. We should know all their names. People are trying to take voting rights away again this year. They are making it the case that many will have to endanger themselves and their loved ones in order to exercise their right to vote. This has already had an effect on the primaries. Certain areas are being targeted for discrimination, just as in Lee's time, and many of them are areas chiefly populated by minorities. During a pandemic, you should have the right to vote from the safety of your own home. As an Oregonian, I can safely vote by mail, but everyone should have this right. No matter who you are, or where you live, or how much money you make, or what color your skin is, you should not have to risk contracting a deadly disease to participate in our democratic system. I urge you to fight for your rights. Remember George W. Lee. That's all for this week. Please give me a subscribe and thumbs up. Limit your time in public spaces. Wear masks. Black Lives Matter. I'll see you next time on Out of the Past.